Hello, my name is AJ Goldsby. I'm a life master from Pensacola, Florida, and I'm coming back today to uh, continue with my video series on the game Wesley So versus Alexei Shurov. Uh, it's the 19th Sigamon or Sigamon, I'm not sure exactly how to pronounce that, but uh, I believe it's Sigamon in company tournament from June 2011. And Wesley So de defeats the veteran player, Grandmaster Alexei Shurov in a very wonderful, tremendously well-played game. And uh, it, it actually comes in many parts. Uh, basically, Shirov is totally outplayed in the opening. Uh, he's outplayed in the middle game, the very somewhat limited middle game, and completely outplayed in the end game. And But I want to try to touch on those. Normally in my videos, I don't go into too much depth or analysis because of the fact that um, I have a web page, and I have already posted my web page for this game on the Internet. And like I said, when I'm through with the videos and through with the video series, I'll provide all the appropriate links. If you click on the little box just below the YouTube video that says show more, uh, you will find I'll post a link uh, for the web page in that area there. And also I'll post the link for the replay page for this game on the Chess Games website if you'd like to replay the game at your leisure or your leisure there on the and just you know go through it slowly and at your own speed. You can do that on your own. But uh, anyway, let's go ahead and look at the game, and this is a really tremendous game. We already covered the first eight moves in depth in part one. This is part two of the video. Continuing onward, the game went d4, d5. We're just going to run through the first eight moves here rather quickly. Knight f3, knight f6, e3, e6, 5b3, uh, knight bd7, bishop d3, bishop d6, uh, bishop 7, bishop b2, queen e7, and now white plays knight e5. Uh, probably the soundest move or the simplest move, certainly the one that proved up by theory, would be simply for white to play castles there. That would be the simplest move for white. and give white a small but uh, verifiable advantage, and I check that with many different chess engines. That's one of the things I can say about this game, my analysis for this game. Sometimes I only use one or two or sometimes three uh, chess engines. This game I actually spent almost three months on analyzing it, before I, and before I analyzed it, I... I really uh, gave it to several students and asked other people to look at it as well. And uh, But anyway, I, I, I checked all my work many times with many different analysis engines and also had several former students and friends. They also looked at this game as well, so I'm quite sure of the results. And again, opening theory, I have several books on both the Moran and the Reynolds system, and they give eight castles as White's main line there. And you can look that up in anything like Encyclopedia of Chess Openings. That would probably be the most trusted reference, or even MCO. But going back to the game here, uh, So plays knight e5. And the main reason he played knight e5 here was, uh, I think if you uh, really, let, let's just quickly look at it. Let's say what would happen, why did So play knight e5? Sometimes I think the best way to understand a chess game is try to ask yourself, why did a player play a move? Or what would happen if he hadn't played this series of moves? In other words, what, get to the core of the, 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 the variation. What is the ideas behind the moves themselves? And I think that really helps you to understand what a player was or wasn't trying to do at that particular point. Let's say here that White had just simply uh, castled here. Let's just say that White had castled, okay? And then Black had, had castled. And then maybe White had played Knight BD2. And then White played D takes C4 here. Oh, certainly Black, White should here capture with the Knight. That would be the simplest move. But let's just backtrack a minute and say that White took with a pawn here, okay? And then white, black can simply play e5 here. And at this point, uh, any chess engine will just fire up Fritz here really quickly. And uh, Fritz 12 is, Fritz 12 I consider to be the most trusted analysis engine. And uh, you can see that I'm loading Fritz now just very quickly. And, um, you know, it, well, white's still clearly better here according to the analysis engine. Uh, white, white should play queen c2. But nonetheless, I think black's problems as compared to the game are much less because he, he eventually he can exchange off this pawn and leave White with a pair of what they call the hanging pawn duo here in the center. Uh, White's still clearly better because he has more space and maybe a little bit better pawn structure. But I, and let's just I'm just going to delete that variation very quickly. But the, the my main idea there of a reason for showing you that was the reason that So played knight e5 at this point was he's trying to mechanically block this king pawn. It physically prevent this king pawn from advancing. In other words, he's, and also a lot of games have a theme. And that's another thing I've learned to recognize as I've gotten older in chess and more experienced. A lot of times when you see the same idea 
come up again and again, especially at a higher level with a really good player, say a master or especially grandmasters, you realize that a game has a theme. In other words, one player is trying to do something. And here, Wesley so is very clearly, he's trying to make Black's uh, dark square bishop there on c8 basically a prisoner. He's trying to prevent that, that piece from ever moving or ever getting out and coming into play. So that becomes one of the themes of this entire game. And that really leads you to really understand the whole purpose or the reason and the logic behind this early 95 idea. And again, like I said, just a simple, uh, backing up there, just a simple castles for white is a main line accepted by theory. That was white's main alternative. Would have given white a small but fairly solid advantage. But uh, so decided to play something different. Now you have to ask yourself also, too, uh, why did so play this move? I'm sure it wasn't just you know, to pr prevent him from playing e5. In other words, had he studied Shirov's games, had he found a possible weakness, had Shirov played this particular variation before and played it poorly, uh, had so decided, worked with his trainer and decided that Shirov had, had certain tendencies and he tended to overreact to moves like this. I mean, we could go on and on and, and theorize and, and guess at some of the intentions of Wesley So and his trainer, but uh, these are all just intelligent guesses that we really can't say for sure. Uh, I'm not really sure myself. It goes back earlier to this earlier B3 move. You know, I mean, he played B3 here. That's a, not the main line there. You know, he could have played the Moran variation, the main line, and we already covered that in the first part of the video. But um, he played B3 with the intention, I think, of getting Shirov outside of his comfort zone, of getting Shirov outside of his known variations, because Shirov is an excellent theoretician. He has a very deep knowledge of many opening systems. So I think that So must have, and he certainly must have prepared this before the game. I don't think he played this on a whim, not by a long shot. Uh, top level chess today, it's just, that's just not the way really good level chess is played. I think most players, uh, even though they don't talk about it, they may make, make light about it. Many of them have trainers and they work very deeply on some of their opening ideas. They spend weeks and months and they don't become a top player without becoming very good at a variation. And the process of that becoming a very good player, basically, sometimes they absorb everything there is to know about a certain opening line. So I don't think that that was an accident, not by a long shot. But anyway, you know, going back to the actual game here, uh, So plays knight e5, and again, that's the idea is to restrict black, prevent him from pushing his e-pawn, and, and maybe even try to get uh, Shirov to do exactly what he did here in this game. Now here's Shirov, he completely overreacts in my opinion. He, uh, by far, you, and you, can, you don't need to take my word for this, you, there's so many engines on the chess internet today. There's many free ones like Firebird or um, Houdini or Crafty or et cetera, et cetera. I mean, there's just too many chess engines now. You can simply just download one of these for free and, uh, you know, fire it up and, and analyze this game on your own. Many of them work in many different open interfaces, such as WinBoard or, or you know, um, whatever interface you might happen to have. But uh, if you get your own chess engine or buy an application like one of the good programs like Ribka or Fritz or Houdini or whatever, you'll see what I'm talking about. Here are the best move for black, and, and also the theory here. Uh, this uh, position is known in one of my books. I have a book on the rental system, and the, and the, the uh, author just made, makes the comments that black simply castles here and just has a slightly constricted and inferior game. And in that particular game between two IMs, black played an early C5, and, and you know, it, it, he, he, he actually got a draw in that game. But they, I don't think that game is really relevant to this game. I'm not going to cover it here. Because there the play was much weaker, and also the plans were the players were much weaker than in this game. Wesley So is a almost a, he's twenty six sixty seven grandmaster, and Alexei Shirov is twenty seven oh one. And we're talking about players that were rated twenty three and twenty four hundred feet a. So I don't really think that that particular encounter is relevant to this one. But anyway, going back to this game here, if you no opening theory, or if you want to fire up any chess engine, the correct move here for for Black should have been just simply castles. That would have been by far the, the best move. The, the king is safe, and, and there's an idea here for black, several ideas for black. He could maybe play, you know, something like, you know, maybe c5. He could play knight e, you know, he, maybe he could play knight e8 and, and g6 and f6 and try to kick this knight out here. He could play bishop takes knight. You know, he could do a number of different things. He could play d takes c, you know, something of this nature. He could play knight e4 and try to play f5. I saw another game where black won. And it was by a 2600 Grandmaster. He was playing a 2000 player, but he played 94 and F5 and got a very overwhelming game. Of course, White didn't play very well. He, he was a fairly low rated player, but that's a different idea there. For Black, he played, you know, 94 and F5 and anchored his own knight on, on the E4 square. Basically, the, you know, basically the idea there, the strategic idea being that if Black has a knight 
anchored on the E4 square, that might counterbalance or, or at least uh, nullify somewhat the effects of White's powerful knight on the E5 square. So, I mean, there's some many different ideas here, and but theory says that Black should simply castle there. And um, beyond a shadow of doubt, that would be absolutely Black's best move. We're just going to quickly delete that variation because I'm not interested in that, keeping that there. But uh, anyway, uh, Shirov should definitely just simply castle here. You know, either castling or c5. One of those two moves is by far the safest and the best for black. Um, here, Shirov, he, he now, to, a lot of times you have to say, well, you know, I hear players say, well, this player did something bad or, you know, he got a very bad position, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And they assume that a lot of times, you know, it's when a class C player makes a bad move, it's just because lack of knowledge or he doesn't know what he's doing or doesn't completely understand the opening. And when a grandmaster like Shirov does that, uh, I think it's a, it's a different set of reasons at, that are at work, different, different set of forces that are at work in the game. Shirov has a reputation as a fighter. He's very ingenious. He can literally make something out of almost nothing. Uh, he's always uh, combative. He's always ta tactical. He's always trying to make something happen. And when you're that kind of player, you tend to push the boundary. You push the envelope a little bit. You're going to explore the edges, and you're going to do things just on the edge. In other words, you don't become a, a player who have that kind of reputation without becoming a very ingenious and a very creative player. And sometimes when you're, you can get a little too creative. And I think that's what happens here is he basically, you know, he, he tries to get a, you know, he, he violates one of the rules, probably knowingly so, but he does so because that he thinks, you know, he's, he, maybe he can get his young uh, opponent to overreact or perhaps make a mistake, but he plays bishop d4 check. I would have to say absolutely unqualified that that's an exclaim question and probably even an inferior or dubious idea there. Black, As I already said, black should have simply castled or played c5. Both of those moves would have been better than this move. Uh, and, and the uh, computers notice an immediate downturn in black's position. Of course, the idea of, uh, of moving the same piece twice that's a general rule of thumb or principle that many players already realize. I don't like to use the word principle because a principle is something that's pretty much true all the time. I would call it more correctly a rule of thumb. The rule of thumb there being that in the opening, you don't move any piece twice. And so Shirov violates that rule here, but I think he's doing so on purpose. You know, He has some specific idea there in mind. White has to play knight d2 here. That move is just simply absolutely forced. And now here again, once more, black should just simply castle. Uh, or even play knight e4. One of those two moves, you know, would have to be almost certainly be best. And there's a third idea here for that I found. Uh, well, actually, one of my students uh, originally suggested this, and it's not that bad. I mean, it's it's a second or third choice of many of the chess engines. Is Black could have simply played this bishop b3 move. He could have tried that. Uh, I'm rather bishop a3 here, and you know, White could exchange. And in one, you know, in, in one chess engine, a very weak chess engine on a friend's. Celeron laptop, it suggested the continuation bishop to c3, bishop b4, and we get a draw by repetition of position. Well, needless to say, that's silly. If black plays bishop a3 and white plays bishop b, bishop c3 and black plays bishop b4, white probably should either exchange off or simply, maybe even better, simply continue queen c2 there, and that would give white a solid advantage there. I think that would be the best variation there for white. But still, I think, you know, that's another idea, something else that black could have done in addition to what occurred in the game there. Again, I'm going to just delete that variation. And um, probably any of those ideas, castling or bishop a3 or even c5 or knight e4, probably any of those would have been would have been a little safer. Certainly castling would have been a little bit safer than what he did in the actual game. He played the idea there of, of, of uh, knight takes knight e5. And you have to ask yourself why he did that. Well, basically he knows white's knight is extremely powerful. And if he doesn't eject that knight or get rid of that knight, if he allows that knight to stay there indefinitely, then basically white's going to have a huge advantage. The problem with this move is that this, now white does get double pawns, and he probably weakens his squares somewhat. You know, there's there's consequences to having double pawns. But, you know, on the plus side for white, this knight gets kicked on knight on f6 when this pawn, we'll go ahead and look at the moves, white plays 10, d takes e5. Now I guess I'm going to have to cut it off there, and now black plays knight d7. I'm saying I'm running a little bit long. We're going to pretty much call that it. This is it for part two. And we'll pick up the uh, part three with White's 11th move there, which is the next move. But, well, thank you for watching this video. And again, we're going to continue to explore this game in part three of this video series on this game. Thank you for watching and have a great day.